Good evening. My name is Susan Cohn, and I'm the Associate Vice Chancellor of Alumni and Constituent Engagement at Washington University. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Wednesdays with WashU, featuring alumna Dr. Rochelle P. Walensky. Tonight's event is co-sponsored by the Washington University Alumni Association and Arts and Sciences. A special thank you to alumni Bob and Jan Newman in San Francisco who have supported this event. Also, a very special thank you to Dr. Walensky's classmate, Dr. Avi Amin. Dr. Amin assisted us in inviting Dr. Walensky to speak this evening. Interviewing Dr. Walensky this evening is Feng Sheng Hu, Dean of Arts and Sciences, Lucille P. Markey, Distinguished Professor, and Professor of Biology and Earth and Planetary Sciences, who became Dean of Arts and Sciences in July 2020. He is widely recognized for his innovative interdisciplinary research on long-term ecosystem dynamics in relation to climate change. Prior to his appointment at Washington University, who was a longtime leader and faculty member at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He is the author of 130 scholarly articles in publications including Nature, Science, and Proceedings of the National Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has received extensive research funding from federal agencies, including numerous grants from the National Science Foundation. Who was elected a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 2008. He has been named a Packard Fellow in Science and Engineering, a Fulbright Scholar, and a Fellow of the Ecological Society of America. Dean Hu, Dr. Walensky, welcome. Thank you, Susan. Good evening, and thank you all for joining us. It's my great pleasure to be here today with Dr. Rachel Walensky. Dr. Walensky studied biochemistry, arts, and sciences at Washington University, and she was the recipient of the Eleanor and Frederick Way Miller Scholarship. She graduated in 1991 and went on to earn an MD from the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and a Master of Public Health degree from the Harvard School of Public Health. Dr. Walensky began her medical career at the height of the HIV AIDS crisis, and her work since then has focused on understanding, treating, and combating infectious diseases. Her pioneering research helped advance the national and global response to the disease, and she's a well-respected expert on AIDS, HIV, the value of testing, and the treatment of life-threatening viruses. In December 2020, she was selected to be the 19th director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the 9th administrator of the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry. We are extremely proud that a WashU alumna was selected for this critical role at a time when the country and the world are counting on the CDC's science and leadership. Welcome back to St. Louis, Dr. Walensky. Thank you so much. <laughs> so let's get the interview going. Thank you again for joining us. Did you always know you wanted to go into science and medicine? In other words, what were some of the things that led you to study biochemistry at WashU? Um, first, let me just say how wonderful it is to be back to one of my several homes. I wouldn't say many, but, but this is where sort of I started taking big risks. This is where I um, learned and, and received such a foundation that, that launched me into, into my current career. So I just want to say how moving and touching it is for me to be back um, it, with this audience in this forum. So thank you very much for that. Um, I knew when I was little that I wanted to be a physician. I had a, a young, uh, I had a woman pediatrician actually, and she was a real role model for me. Um, I always loved sciences, I always loved math, and um, I loved talking to people, and that seemed like a really fruitful way to be able to combine the two, and um, was really grateful to have the opportunity to come here to Washington University in St. Louis in 1987 to, to launch that career. 
um, and really get the foundation in biology and biochemistry to do so. And what are some of the most important skills you learned at WashU and still use today? Um, there are several. Um, the first I'm going to say is the reason that I came, and that's Jan Snow, who's sitting in the front corner here. Um, Jan was my admissions counselor um, who recruited me here. Um, and I will tell you, I got off the plane for my visit um, after I had been accepted. And um, Jan said to me, hi, Rochelle, how was your trip from DC? And I, I had no idea that she would recognize me, that she would know my name, that she would recognize who I was. Um, but she knew who I was. She had studied my picture. And she had um, knew that that would be meaningful to me. And that's where I learned. And, and to this day, I do that a lot um, because that personal touch carried through through my entire St. Louis four, what, four years at WashU. But it, it taught me from the very beginning how much the personal touch matters and how much we really need to look at an individual person. Um, when I was recruiting fellows in my prior prior job at, as chief of Mass General, I always studied their face page before they came, and I always knew who everybody was. And Jan taught me that, because I knew how important it was. Um, I learned to listen here. Um, and I think that that's really important, because I think, um, especially now in patient care, it's, it's so, so important to listen rather than to talk. Especially now in this moment, people have always asked me, how do you get more people vaccinated? And the answer is to listen, not to talk. Um, and I think I learned to take risks, because um, when I got here, I would have never anticipated that I would have taken thermodynamics. I would have never thought that I would have been up to that task. Um, but watch you taught me that I could do that. Um, so lots of instrumental lessons here that I take with me every single day. Great. And how did you become interested in the science of viruses, mm. vaccine delivery, and public health specifically? So, you know, when I was at WashU, I knew I wanted to be a physician. I knew I wanted to apply to medical school. And that's kind of where the vision got blurry. <laughs> I had no idea what I wanted to do after that, and almost concerningly so. So ultimately, I went into, in fact, into internal medicine. But even in internal medicine, um, I didn't really know what I was going to do next. Was I going to be a primary care physician? Was I going to be a researcher? What field was I going to do, um, want to pursue? And um, I was a house officer in inner city Baltimore in 1995. Um, and nearly half the patients we admitted every night were dying of AIDS. And um, it was a really striking time. Um, the inequities of who was getting AIDS and who was dying were, were striking. Um, and at the end of my internship, 1996, was when the cocktail was first FDA approved. Um, so for the first time ever, we had people who were dying who we could give hope to. Um, and it was striking. Um, so it was this intersection of what we could do for inequities and for, for access to care for people who didn't have care, um, and also this incredible science that was evolving right in front of our eyes um, in HIV that really, it, it wasn't necessarily, oh, I love virions. It was like, I have to take care of these kinds of patients and I have to pursue this and see how this goes. That's so inspiring. <laughs> in the summer of 2020, we started a large online course mm -hmm. called The Pandemic, Science and Society. Over 1,300 students enrolled. Unfortunately, you were unavailable to give a guest lecture. But if you had, what would you have wanted to say to the students? Um, we had and continue to have a pretty frail public health infrastructure in this country that has been underinvested in to get us to this moment. So CDC and all of its public health partners across the country, and, and we work with 50 state uh, public health departments and over 3,000 local public health departments. Um, over the last decade, between we've had H1N1, we have had um, Ebola, we've had Zika, and now we've had um, COVID-19 and numerous other threats in between. 
Um, and we've lost 60,000 public health jobs during that last decade. So the investment in public health has not been there, and um, it's not just workforce. It has been in laboratory infrastructure, in data infrastructure, um, through public health. We get data streams from every single one of those jurisdictions, and they don't talk to one another. The pipes don't talk to one another. They don't talk to actually our electronic health records and our hospitals. Um, and so I think the lesson that I would speak to is the real investment that we have needed, that, that the American Rescue Plan has jump-started and that this pandemic has jump-started, but we have a long way to go in terms of investing in public health. Um, when I've talked to many of our public health leaders throughout the country and our, our state public health officers, um, there's no job security. It's administration to administration. There is no funding necessarily, longitudinal funding. It's two or three year funding, so they can't hire people. Um, there is no uh, uh, long-term investments. The, the, the uh, budgets are disease specific. So um, one of the classic examples is in contact tracing. When we needed to start contact tracing for COVID-19, the best people to do contact tracing are the people who do, do contact tracing for sexually transmitted infections. Um, if you have a case of syphilis in your health department, you know how to find every other person who might have been in contact with that person. Those people know how to do contact tracing, but they, we couldn't cross the budgets. So those are the kinds of real challenges that our public health infrastructure has in this country and that we really need to fix if we are going to be prepared for the next pandemic. Very important points for sure. <clears throat> so in late 2020, while the pandemic was surging, then President-elect Biden asked you to take on the role of leading the CDC. What are some of the first thoughts the cross to your mind the day you were asked. <laughs> so let me just sort of rewind the clock to that day. Um, it, was, it was November or so of 2020. Um, I, I was running a division of infectious diseases. This division was hurting. I mean, any division of infectious diseases during this pandemic has been hurting. Um, we were staffing many different hospitals to try and give support to places that didn't have. We, we, are, are, we had at one point had 400 patients with COVID in our hospital. Um, it, was, it was an intense time. And, and what I was doing was trying to help my faculty survive, my fellows survive it. Um, I never expected this phone call. <laughs> um, so I was up in my, um, my chairman's office actually having a meeting. And um, somebody had taken a message for me when I came down, and, and it said, Ron Klain called. And there was a 202 area code. He'd like you to call him back. And I was like, Ron Klain? I think I know that name. Um, so I Googled Ron Klain. Like, really, Ron Klain? Um, and then before I called him back, I called my husband. Um, and to his great credit, my husband said, listen, and whatever he asks, don't say no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and because my first thought would have been like, really? Um, that was still my first thought. Um, so I did, I listened, I you know, digested a little bit, and, um, and then it sort of settled in as to, okay, I'm being asked to do this. Of course, my first thought was, um, am I really up to the task? Is this, I mean, the CDC is in a hard place, right? It was in a complex place, um, it was not, uh, the, the, it did not have its rightful place in public health that it merited. Um, and uh, so I was being asked to do, I, we used to say of, of some of the highest jobs, you had to be smart enough to um, get them and dumb enough to take them. And this felt like <laughs> one of those jobs. Um, so, you know, the, and, and really was I gonna be able to deliver in what, um, what was being asked of me? And that at the same time, and I said this in my nomination speech, um, we're trained to answer codes. In clinical medicine, when your code beeper goes off, you run. Um, and the country was coding. This was in the middle of our alpha surge. We had 120,000 cases a day. Um, so I felt like somebody was calling, you know, my pager was gone off, and, it was, and the answer was not no. That's what we're trained to do. So it, there was a lot of, <laughs> a lot of thoughts, um, especially since I just I never expected the call. That sounds like a lot to digest. <laughs> <It was. laughs> and, and what do you envision the impact of COVID-19 will be 
on our lives in five years? Um, one of the great pieces of advice that I have now taken to heart is not to predict. <laughs> because almost anything with this pandemic that we've predicted has been wrong. The vision that I see, um, ultimately, I, I do think five years from now we will not be living in surge after surge anymore. Um, I do really hope that there will be a more robust public health infrastructure and that the investments that are being made now, $7.4 billion in the American Rescue Plan, um, to invest in that public health infrastructure. I would really like to see public health a more revered specialty or a more revered place to be, um, especially after this pandemic. I mean, the, the threats, that thousands of jobs have been lost in public health due to threats um, to public health workers. And so I would, I have said, I will go to, to academic places. I will, I wanna talk to the next generation of people in health and medicine and public health to try and, uh, one of my colleagues said to me in infectious disease, um, as we were tired in this pandemic, this is our Super Bowl moment, right? Um, this is where we rise to the occasion. So I, I do think that that will be our future. I do think um, in getting to that future, we may have more variants, we may have more surges. I, I'd like to think that the amplitude of those surges will be less with more and more immunity um, throughout the population. Um, but that's my vision and hope for five years from now. Great. So in arts and sciences, we talk a great deal about how our various disciplines converge and intersect and how those intersections strengthen our work and our community. Can you discuss the value of interdisciplinary connections in your career and your work now with the CDC? Yeah, this is, I think this is really, this was really highlighted when I started my research career. So my research prior to coming after, I, so I did a clinical infectious disease fellowship and then I um, did research in mathematical modeling and um, cost effectiveness analysis, economic analysis of prioritizing care. If you don't have enough resources for everyone with HIV, both domestically and around the world, how do you prioritize those resources so you can blanket the world with the most health that's possible? Um, I entered a research group. Um, I was an infectious disease fellow at the time, and um, I just assumed everybody else there was infectious disease docs. But this research group included decision scientists and epidemiologists and biostatisticians and operations researchers. And um, they all talked the same language. We could talk, all talk HIV, but we all had different expertise in very different places. And, and it added so much to the richness of the science that we were able to do that this operations researcher who had been in business in Booz Allen could actually now talk to me about TB care in Malawi. And I could teach him about the latency of TB and he could show me um, that that quantitative assessment was actually not accurate the way we were, we were modeling it. Um, and that I think was, was key to the success of my own research. Um, and really as I think about moving forward and, and what I see and do at CDC, um, you know, we, <laughs> The, the breadth of the 12,000 people who work at that agency, um, the experience is, is truly extraordinary. Um, and that's been fun for me to learn about from the inside. Um, but you know, Friday we launched our guidance on, on new metrics. Um, we had you know, somebody from education and schools talking about the impact of these metrics somebody from communications talking about how we were going to launch this or what, how this was going to be received. Um, somebody from the correctional facilities about how, and, and working with sort of people around the country and then taking that knowledge. Um, you know, I will read a paper, our first paper on test, test to stay in schools was from the UK. And I said, this sounds like we should be doing this. And somebody from the school task force said, well, they actually, in, in high schools in the UK, they actually rotate teachers, they don't rotate students. Um, so you kind of need to know that if you're gonna <laughs> apply one piece of information from a different setting. So it's just been extraordinary. And it's, I think it's most fun. That's where I learn the most from, from people in, in other disciplines. I sort of compare it to the iPhone. Um, you know, 
when your iPhone makes phone calls but it doesn't have internet, it's broken, right? <laughs> um, so, so like I think that that interdisciplinary is so key. This sounds so stimulating. Makes me feel like I want to join your team. <laughs> <laughs> we have plenty of jobs in public health. <laughs> uh, sure, uh, well, sure, the chancellor will stay here. <laughs> So what's the best piece of career advice you have been given and you would want to share with the students today? Um, not to give up, really. And, and so much of my research career was rejections. Um, and, and I always tell my mentees that, you know, I have two CVs. There's a CV of everything that worked and then there's a CV of everything you did that didn't work, but um, was a lot of work anyway. So it looks like, it does like appear you've done some stuff. That, um, that paper that got rejected four times, um, you know, took a year to get in, and there's only one line on your CV for it, right? Um, so I, that, but also um, to just pursue really big questions. One of my research mentors said to me, well, if it was easy, somebody else would have done it. Um, and to go for what are the really, really hard questions to answer because those are, I think that that's really where we develop, where we learn, um, and um, I, I, pursuing big questions, I, I think, is, is really key. And, and that goes to back to my foundation here to just challenge yourself, to go after the big stuff, um, to, you know, it, Many times through my career, I could have easily said, and probably did, I don't think I can do that one. Um, but, uh, but, you know, with a lot of support, a lot of mentorship, um, I, you know, we've pursued those things. I guess the only, the, the other thing I would say is to, um, to try and give voice to those who don't have a voice. Um, that's been true in my career in HIV. There, that's been true in, in COVID. Um, and that's been true in a lot of the health equity work that we've been doing um, to really just, um, I, I, get, I get passionate about an issue and I try and give voice to it um, academically um, because I think those issues are important and to just make sure that, that you know, people who don't have a voice get one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really appreciate those words of wisdom. So your earlier research helped advance our national and global response to HIV AIDS uh, crisis. How did the work shape your understanding of the interconnectedness of our world and the benefits of collaboration? Oh, this is so key. Um, so our research work initially in HIV was in, um, in the United States. And um, over time, it became very clear that HIV was much more of an, a disease internationally than it was here in the United States. And so my research mentor ca started calling around the world and looking for the best data that were out there. Um, there were people who were collecting kind of numerator data, but we needed both numerator and denominator data. We needed cost data, which were really hard to come by across the world. Not everybody was collecting those data. So we developed research collaborations first in Cote d'Ivoire, um, where the French had done really good work in, in HIV, um, in uh, South Africa, and in India. And um, we developed those collaborations and built the model, our mathematical model, sort of working in those countries as well. And then all of a sudden it was 13 countries and then 15 countries. Um, and you realize how, world, how small the world is. Um, so fast forward to COVID, right? Um, the network, of, the scientific network, and I think the best example is really what happened with Omicron. Um, and that is, you know, many of those collaborators that we had in HIV are the same ones that are working in COVID. It's not a surprise that many of the same people who've been working in the, in the clinical sciences and in the infectious disease world um, on HIV are very much working in, in COVID as well. And um, so we got this phone call from our collaborators in South Africa about um, this new variant. Um, I can tell you, I was literally put, literally putting the turkey on the table on Thanksgiving, um, and I got five phone calls from the White House. <laughs> um, so that went there on Thanksgiving dinner. Um, but it was, I mean, that, it, there was urgency to this question, and we were on the phone that evening with South Africa. Um, 
the, the data that we get from other places is key. Um, what is happening in Denmark right now where they have a BA2 surge and we do not, um, and how we're learning about that. Um, the the um, vaccine data, the vaccine effectiveness data that they're able to pull together in Israel, I have weekly phone calls with Israel, with the UK, I have weekly phone calls with South Africa, um, we had a phone call today with Canada. So, you know, it's just key um, to work collaboratively together and you realize, you know, if you can zoom across the street, you can zoom across the world um, and it's it's been really and, and also, why did you make a decision with that guideline in the UK? What, what is different about the UK in terms of your resources, in terms of your um, access, or you know, the science is probably pretty close to the same. So we're learning from each other all of the time. Um, the give and take, the share, it, it's, it's essential. Um, and, and especially, we can't, study, we can't study Omicron if we don't have it here. Um, so, so we just, we take that, that science and then we share what we know as well. And this is a small question. As director of the CDC, during such a critical time, what does a typical day look like for you? <laughs> um, there is not a typical day. There is not a typical day. I can tell you on, uh, I, you know, there are many, many activities I engage in. We do press conferences. We were doing them three times a week with the White House. They're now down to once a week. Um, I have testified in front of Congress 12 times. Um, that's a lot of prep. Um, there's a lot of preparation for everything. So um, there, there's a term they call it murder boards. Um, which is kind of how it is, <laughs> um, where they sort of give you hard questions in hard ways, the way um, not so friendly senators might, uh, might address you um, to say, and, and really try and catch you off guard. Um, and uh, we do that for press calls, we do that for, for, um, for we do a lot of prep. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there's, that there's a lot of engagement with out external partners, whether that's through our associations, our medical associations, whether that's through our state and local health officials, our state epidemiologists, there's a lot of engagement there. Um, we've had 18 advisory committee to immunization practices meetings. Um, so today I can tell you, I, this morning I was at a White House press conference at, at the White House. Um, flew here, spoke at the, at the medical school. Um, between there and now, I, I was on a, a call with the um, cabinet to update where we are with our new presidential plan. Um, so there isn't a typical day. What I can tell you is I have just an extraordinary team. Um, the work is hard, there's no question the work is hard, but it has been such a gift to meet these people um, and to work with and for these people and to, to to learn from them. Sounds like an exciting job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and this is a simple question. So what gets you out of bed in the morning? In other words, what motivates you to tackle the day ahead? Um, well, part of it is the work of, you know, th there's 12,000 people who are working at the CDC to protect the public's health, to protect all of us, to, to comb through voluminous literature to understand what is the best thing to do. Um, and you know my name, but you're not gonna know their name. And they're doing it because this is what they do. This is the spirit of what they do, and they're motivated to help others without any credit at all. And so my job is to make sure that their science gets heard, their voice gets heard, um, and that we protect the public um, from you know, any health threats um, that are from here or around the world. So I, I do that because we're not out of this pandemic yet, and because once we are out of this pandemic, we have a lot of work to do to regain health in this country and, and all of the, the other challenges that we've had with health during this pandemic. And now I have a few pre-submitted questions from the online audience to ask. Was there a particular mentor at WashU who helped you decide what path to take after you completed uh, your bachelor's degree? Um, so Jan's always been there. <laughs> um, I did, 
uh, do research with um, Dr. Paul Levine, a geneticist at um, the medical school. Um, and it was one of those moments, and, and I tell my, I used to tell my, my uh, mentees this all the time. I just knocked on the door and said, I'm eager and I'll promise not to get in the way. Will you have me here and I will try and learn and try and be helpful. Um, and he took me under his wing um, and I worked there for two years. I did my senior thesis with him. Um, and then he had a lab, so he worked on heat check proteins in killifish. Um, and fish have nucleated red cells so we could study uh, heat check proteins in their red cells. Um, and then he had a lab in Woods Hole Marine Biology Labs in, um, in, at the Cape. Um, and so he said, hey, Rochelle, you want to come with me over the summer and we're going to go to the Cape and learn about fish. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for two summers, I did that with him. Um, and he just really opened my eyes to what, what was possible, an incredible world out there when Quite honestly, I mean, I, I, I was a good student and I knew biochemistry at the time I graduated, but I didn't have a whole lot to offer his genetics lab. Um, and he gave me, you know, a chance. So that, um, I will never forget that. Sounds like a great mentor. Indeed. A wonderful location to spend your summer. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> now, if you could go back to your WashU days, is there anything you would do it differently to prepare for the career path you chose? Or would you consider any other lines of work? Um, you know, I, I, I now talk, my son is pre-med. <laughs> and so, you know, a lot of what I've said to him is open your, you will take a lot of medicine, you will take a lot of chemistry, you will, you will learn a lot in that space, open your eyes to many of the diverse things that you can take advantage of in college that you will, may never have the opportunity to take advantage of again. You may not learn how, you know, this, you know, Russian history or political science or whatever the course may be. I did some of that at WashU. I wish I had done a little bit more of that. Mm. I like that. Mm. <laughs> That's what a liberal arts is for, right? So. Right, exactly, exactly. So in addition to your liberal arts degree and your medical degree, you earned an MPH. How have your studies in public health shaped your, under your understanding of your role in the CDC and also as a physician? Yeah, so I um, completed my medical school residency and then my, my fellowship and to learn how to do Markov simulation modeling and cost structures and decision science, um, I needed to take some of the didactic classes, biostatistics and, and, and the costing um, uh, Markov modeling. So I did that through the School of Public Health. So I did my master's after I had finished my research fellow or my clinical fellowship. Um, but as a broad master's in public health, um, you also have to take sort of the liberal arts equivalent of public health, society and health, envi environmental health, ethics. Um, I, I remember taking ethics and, and understand, and the ethics paper that we had to write a paper at the end. And so the ethics paper that I wrote was, how do we finance HIV care in this country? How do we pay for it? And why are so many people left behind? Um, and so there's um, that opportunity was this intersection at a perfect time for me to understand and get the didactic methods, but also understand societies and health and population pyramids and things um, you know, that we talk about even right now. Um, we're trying to vaccinate 70% of the world um, can we do that if we don't have a vaccine for children? Is that going to even be possible if we don't have a vaccine for children? So in population pyramids where many countries have a very large percent of their population as, as children. So it, it's, it's been essential for my career um, and for my career to get to CDC and really I've used a lot of it since I've been there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the next question is from Shreya K, one of our current pre-health students, and she wants to know what has been the biggest struggle you have had to overcome to be in a leading position as a woman in science? Uh, you know, I don't necessarily um, 
leadership is hard, regardless of your gender. <laughs> um, so I would say, you know, there have been times, I, I, I just spoke to the uh, women in medicine at, at the hospital. Um, there have been times where I truly have gotten calls. This was, I, I was earlier in my career where I would get calls and say, can you give this talk, comma, we need a woman. <laughs> um, and I, I thought, well, okay. Um, and you, you know, on the one hand, you get turned off. Um, on the other hand, you say, I am going to give the best darn talk that you have ever heard <laughs> um, and demonstrate to you that you actually wanted me, not because I was a woman. Um, and so, you know, there have been some sharp elbows in certain rooms, um, and I have um, spoken my voice. I've listened, I've tried to be at the table. I have been at the table, um, but I think leadership in general is hard. So I, I don't necessarily think it, it is gender specific. Mm -hmm. Along the same lines, what strategies do you use to handle the relentless criticism that can oh. come with being a public figure, especially as a professional woman? Um, I've learned not to look at Twitter before going to bed. <laughs> Twitter is a really, um, it's an interesting place because on the one hand, um, there's so much essential stuff that comes out on Twitter that you see on Twitter, that there's new science that you might not have seen if you hadn't been on Twitter. Um, so I, I feel like it's this, I have this interesting relationship <laughs> with Twitter right now. Um, I gave blood a couple weeks ago and tweeted a photo of giving blood and, and I thought the comments to that would have been Nice, <laughs> but no, <laughs> they weren't. Um, so, you know, I feel like I have to read some of it. Um, my team helps helps me go through it so I don't have to read all of it because it can get you down, there's no question. But you have to hear what people are saying. You have to understand, um, not necessarily the direct criticism to me personally, but um, we don't like your guidance because. Um, well, what are the perspectives that we might not have accounted for or might not, or, or, or maybe we did, but we had to move forward with this anyway? Um, we need to, I need to be able to hear that. Um, you know, it's hard. I, I don't like my kids to see it. It's, it's a bummer for my kids. Um, so, um, you know, I, I try hard to kind of put my, I, I used to, you know, watch the headlines all the time. I don't watch them as much anymore. <laughs> Survival. <laughs> Sounds like a great strategy. <laughs> <laughs> and what are some of the tips and techniques you personally have deployed to remain grounded, resilient, and optimistic during the last 24 months? Um, there have been so many beautiful moments of kindness in the last two years that I've seen um, at the bedside, that I have seen um, in physicians and how they're caring for one another. Um, that, you know, in the first year, as hard and difficult as it was, um, and our faculty were working, and much like I'm sure all the clinical faculty were working, um, how we took care of one another during that time, I think, is unparalleled. Um, and we will always have that, we will always have that it was challenging, but we were there for each other. We had. We had little tattoos. We had um, stickers with our names on them, so our, our pictures on them, so patients could see our faces. Um, we just gave to one another. You know, my daughter is home, and I don't. And my mother is sick. I'm going to take your shift. It, it, it was just everybody giving in. So I just think that there was so much beautiful stuff that happened during that time, um, and true of CDC as well. I. I you know, I had a few gut punches of data when, when they were coming out, and I would say, at Saturday night, we need to see a data analysis on this. And somebody said, well, we'll call our on-call data team. I was like, we have an on-call data team? <laughs> I don't know we have an on-call data team. Um, and the analysis was done overnight, and by Sunday morning, we had the answer and could, you know, move forward with a policy because we knew what the analysis. So when you, when you realize that, that people are working that hard, one of the things I have really tried to do is just make sure people know how valuable they are because it's hard to get, you know, it's hard to do this over and over again and not get tired. 
Um, so I have, I will randomly pick up a phone and, and call somebody who is not expecting my call and just say, I heard you were really instrumental in that rollout last week and thank you for that. So I try and do five of those a week and just let people know that I see the really hard work that they're doing and I appreciate it and America appreciates it even though I have to say that for America. Now we're going to have to invite you back to provide leadership training. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> so speaking of working hard, scientists are working around the clock to help save lives. We need everyone to work hard, but we also need everyone to be mentally sharp. And stress can definitely hinder that. So how do you and your team at the CDC balance work and the necessity for mental rest to stay fresh and focused? I'm really worried about mental health in healthcare and in public health. Um, we had an MMWR that came out several months ago that showed that two thirds of um, public health workers were depressed and up to 10%, I think, um, had had suicidal ideation in the last year. Uh, this is, it's, it's a huge problem and we've worked hard. Um, I don't have an answer to this. I think we need a larger workforce. I need, think we need an upskilled workforce. We need more people to, to come in and help. Um, one of the things we're really working towards doing at CDC is trying to, we have, um, believe it or not, 2,000 people in our incident management response at any given time. It's, it's ballooned up to 2,500 and then come down again to 2,000 and we're really working hard to streamline those efforts. But when you think about um, the efforts that we have needed to be a part of and Operation Allies Welcome came in the middle of our Delta surge. Um, and uh, so, you know, deploying people to assist in, in screening and vaccinating um, for all the people who came through Afghanistan, from Afghanistan, um, the, the, you know, it's, the, the folk, the work that's happened there um, over the last year, I, you know, I, I didn't realize this, this happened before I came, um, but, you know, the Diamond Princess cruise ships um, didn't have any tests on them the CDC officers repelled from helicopters <laughs> to bring tests to the Diamond cruise ships. So those are the kinds of, the, those, those are the people that we're working with. And I, I, I worry about this. I don't have all the answers, but we're working to try and to streamline that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. One final question. I'm sure this conversation has led you to reflect on your days as a student here in St. Louis. And what is your absolute favorite, favorite memory from your days as a student at WashU? There are so many of them, and it was so great to be back. Um, certainly seeing some, some friends from, from some old friends, <laughs> some young friends, but, but they, they're from a long time ago. Um, it has just been amazing for me, the connections. Um, and I think the pandemic did this, is to help make more connections. People connected more in Zoom. People just were able to connect more. Um, I loved 13. Uh, I just, um, it was, it was springtime, it was, um, it was children, it was um, fun, it was a time to let go. I, I loved 13 Carnival. I have so many wonderful memories, but I, I loved 13 Carnival. Yeah, I'm going to look, look forward to my first one here. Oh, is that right? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> So thank you so much, Dr. Walensky, for such a delightful conversation. And I do appreciate your insights. Uh, you and your work are truly inspiring to all of us and to the students especially. Thank you for spending time with us today and for everything you do to protect public health in the country and in the world. And thank you all to all of you for joining us today, virtually or in person. And have a great evening. Thank you so much. <laughs> it was really a pleasure. <laughs>
We have a few minutes for in-person or live attendees uh, to ask questions. Many of you submitted questions during the registration process. However, with a limited amount of time, a handful were pre-selected to ask questions this evening. So we're gonna jump right in and start with question number one, which will be asked by Dr. Richard Loomis. Dr. Loomis? Hi, Rochelle, how are you? I'm great. I'd like to quick